Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to start our videos on friction, uh, starting with this slide right here. Are you tired of the phrase ignore friction? Right? So uh, we, we've been doing problems uh, all year that usually say frictionless surfaces, frictionless pulleys, weightless this, weightless that, right? So when we talk about frictionless objects, um, it really simplifies uh, so we don't need to worry about this complicated force called friction, right? Um, when I was in school, I, I got kind of annoyed because I wanted to know what the real physics was. I wanted to know the real answer. I didn't want to know what happened if our world had absolutely no friction. I wanted to know what happened if we did have friction, right? So when I was younger in high school doing physics, I really wanted to know what happens if there is friction. So that's what we're going to talk about. What is friction and how does that change our problems, right? So first question here, what is friction, right? So friction is this contact force that opposes motion. So if an object is skidding or sliding on a surface, if it's in contact with an object, or I guess in contact with a surface and moving, there will be friction. Um, now, there are different types of friction. Um, this chapter will go over surface friction, right? But next chapter will actually go over air drag. Air drag is kind of like friction. It is this force opposing motion, only instead of running into sk you know, skidding against solid particles, you're hitting gaseous particles that are causing you to slow down. So I guess a, a force opposing your motion. So that's what friction is. Next, there are two types that we're gonna study, okay? There are two types of friction uh, that we'll go over in this class. One is static friction. Static friction is friction without moving, right? Static, like when we talk about uh, static equilibrium, that usually means that all forces are balanced and you are not accelerating, whether that means you're sitting still or you're moving at a constant velocity, either way, you're not accelerating. So static friction means that you're not moving and the friction is preventing you from moving. Now, kinetic friction is uh, friction between two moving surfaces, right? Uh, this is the usual friction that we all know when you're moving, you're skidding, you're sliding against a, against a surface, then you have kinetic friction. So let's, uh, let's talk about these uh, different types of friction, right? So we've got 518, musical chairs. You are playing musical chairs and you grab a seat real quick when the music stops and you're sitting at rest. How much friction is there between you and the chair, right? So if we were going to draw a free body diagram, right? That's you. We've got MG, the chair is providing a normal force, right? So there is no other force trying to move you. So if there is nothing trying to start motion or anything like that, trying to get you to move, if it's just completely stationary, then there is no acceleration and there is no, um, there's also no friction, right? Um, once we get to the next point though, we'll see that you can still sit still and experience friction. So part B, now your friend tries to push you off the chair unsuccessfully. Does the amount of friction change? So now we have your quote unquote friend, right, is pushing you to the side. Now, does that cause um, friction to pop up? Yes, so here, as a result, we have friction. This is static friction. Uh, it, now it says that they try to push you off the chair unsuccessfully. Now, think about any household object, right? You can, especially your laptop, okay? You're probably watching this on a laptop if you're watching in this on a de desktop. This may not work for you, right? Maybe use a different object. But if you try and push your laptop, you can push pretty hard before it starts moving. But 
eventually the laptop does start moving, right? So that is static friction, the friction that opposes the motion before it starts moving, right? Um, and it has also asks us to graph it. Now, if we have a graph, let's, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in real quick. We have a graph, okay? This is friction, and then this is some pushing force, right? Now, if I push just a little bit, right, that force has to be balanced if it's not moving. So to balance that force, friction is going to match that as long as it's not moving, right? Now, think of this kind of like normal force, okay? So for example, I'm sitting in a chair. If someone else is sitting in the chair next to me, successfully, right? We successfully sit in chairs. Um, oh, we have different uh, weights, right? So if we look at look at sitting in a chair as un, as balanced forces, right? Uh, we have different weights, but the normal force is just balancing whatever it needs to balance, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if you weigh more or less than me, right? As long as the as long as you don't break the chair or as long as the chair doesn't launch you out of its of the chair, uh, then normal force is going to perfectly match mg up until an object uh, you know, loses its structural integrity and you know, everything has its limit, right? Now, uh, let's keep talking about friction. Now, I'm going to push quite a bit harder and the friction is going to continue matching up to a certain point, right? Up to what we can call a breaking point. Now that is going to form a straight linear line, right? It should match every single way, but there will be a point where it's no longer matching because it hits the breaking point. Now I call it the breaking point because of what friction really is, right? So friction is actually atomic structures kind of not really bonding together, but getting in each other's grooves. So if you think about even the smoothest surface that we can ever make, if you look on the atomic, uh, on the atomic level, there are still mountains and valleys between, uh, on, you know, on the surface wherever it is, wherever we're looking at this surface, no matter what it is, there will be mountains and valleys in this atomic structure. And when you have a very, you know, we're talking about millions of atoms on these surfaces, there's going to be a lot of crannies and mountains and valleys where these uh, atoms can kind of fall into place. Okay? Now it's not going to perfectly lock together, right? This is not a locking mechanism. But uh, what it can do is it can sit tight and it can actually fit together. Now, and it does take some force to get that out. Now, it's not a chemical bond, right? They are not bonded together. Uh, your laptop is not one with the desk, but um, it does get into this little puzzle piece kind of. Now, it's not a perfect match, but these mountains and valleys can fit together. Now, they won't all fit together. Like I said, atomic irregularities, you're going to have some that are sitting on top of each other, some that are just kind of not even facing the right way. They, can't, they couldn't even fit in if they wanted to. But all across this surface, millions and millions of atoms, there are going to be some that fall right into that, the, you know, the mountain matches the valley. And that is what static friction is. Static friction is the idea that these atomic structures are lining up and they are able to sit inside each other. Okay? But there is a breaking point, right? As you start pushing hard enough, those will pop out and then that object can then move across the surface, right? So that breaking point is the point where static friction fails and all of those mountains and valleys that we talked about before, those just pop out and then the object starts skidding. Okay? Right. 
So that was part B. Okay, we have a linear relationship between um, some kind of pushing force and static friction. Now, let us see. Finally, your ex friend gets you sliding along the seat. They push harder and harder, and now you start to slide. Is this going to be static or kinetic friction? So this is going to be kinetic friction, right? Because you're moving. Kinetic uh, is a common science term used for motion, right? We have kinetic energy. We also have kinetic friction. So now that you're moving, really interesting question coming up. Why can your ex-friend use less force once you start sliding? So um, we, we usually do a, an example in class. You get a, a decently dense, heavy object, and you can push on it with your finger, and it you know you can give it significant amount of force before it actually starts skidding across the desk. But once you get it skidding, you'll notice that it's actually easier. It takes less force to keep it skidding than when you are trying to get it start skidding in the first place. Now, if we talk about those atomic structures again. It's, it's got it's got a it's got a relationship there. So all those atoms, right? They they are surrounded by these electron clouds. And we talked in a video before how you know you never really touch something. It's really just electron clouds coming into contact with electron clouds, and that can send a sensation through your neurons, and it feels like you're touching something. But really, atomically, your atoms are never touching anything. The electron clouds keep them from doing so. Well. If we're talking on the atomic surface level, right, you've got mountains fitting into valleys. But once that static friction breaks that, that motion and the electron clouds, the electron clouds kind of make it seem like it's a little bit smoother than really just like bumping into mountains and valleys as you go, right? So as you um, push an object, right, you don't feel like a bunch of bumping as you're going over a, an object. Uh, even if you like go over sandpaper, you can then you can start to feel you know some bumping, and you can feel that there is some un unlevel surface there. But on the atomic level, that's what it's experiencing, right? It's it's just kind of flowing over these mountains and valleys, uh, and it it's not like it's falling into every single valley as you move. It's just kind of skidding over the tops. Okay. So that's why it's easier to slide an object once it's moving rather than starting the sliding in the first place. And if we look at this next slide, we can see that. I'm going to go ahead and jump down to the last point on this slide. Um, and we'll go over the first two in a minute. But is the coefficient for static or kinetic friction typically bigger and why? So let's look at this table that we have over here. We have various um, relationships, right? Uh, rubber on concrete, steel on steel, glass on glass, waxed wood on wet or dry snow, Teflon on Teflon, the synovial joints in humans, right? Now, if we look at this, every step of the way, we can see that the static on the left is bigger than the kinetic on the right every single time. Now, wood on wood seems to vary quite a bit, right? Because you're dealing with grains and not every wood is going to be the same as the other. But every step of the way, this seems like they could not get an, a, a, a value. It may be too low to measure, which would be surprising because down at synovial joints, we've got three sig figs down there. We're working with you know the 10,000th place. But uh, every step of the way, other than Teflon and Teflon, static seems to be greater than kinetic. And that is for the exact same reason that we just said, right? As you're moving across that, uh, those, those mountains and valleys, once it's moving, it's just kind of gliding over the top. There's still gonna be resistance because you're still running into those atomic structures, but you're not having to dip down every single mountain and valley and restart the motion every time an atom hits another atom. So uh, that's why a kinetic is actually easier than a static. But once, it, once you get the object going, it's easier. Getting the object going in the first place is the difficult part. 
So that is that answer right there. Okay. Done. Now, what equation can relate normal force to friction? Now we talked about how um, this has to do with an object, you know, being in contact, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, up here, when we were talking about this friction, right, is got to do with contact force opposing motion, right? So the contact is directly related to the contact force. Honestly, I think that normal force is the ultimate contact force. If you're in contact and putting any kind of weight or pressure on any surface in contact with it, you are going to get a normal force back unless you break the integrity of the object. Now, what equation can relate normal force to friction? Well, the friction force is equal to mu times normal force. Now, check. What is this Greek letter in the equation? Right. So this Greek letter, we see it over here. Okay. This is called a mu. It's spelled M-U. Okay. Mu. Uh, mu is the coefficient of friction, um, depending, like we have over here, right? Depending on the two surfaces, you will have a different coefficient with that scenario. Now, uh, whether you're finding static friction, then you would put an S with your F and uh, mu. If you have a kinetic friction, then you would put a K with your F and your mu. But uh, regardless, this is called the fun equation. F equals mu times N. And the normal force is going to directly relate to how much friction there is. And this makes sense if we try to think about this, right? Um, depending on how hard you push down on an object, you can actually increase how, how much friction you're going to experience, right? If you just push down on something lightly, you can actually slide right over. But if you start pushing down harder and harder, you can actually feel that it gets more difficult to slide across the surface, right? Okay, so let's go, let's talk about um, the angle of repose. So the angle of repose is, um, well, actually it's going to explain it to us right quick. So um, let's just go through the problem. A block at rest sits on an adjustable plane. So we can adjust the, the angle of this plane. When the angle is increased to a particular angle theta, the block will start slipping. Theta is the angle of repose. Okay? So that's what angle of repose is. The angle at which um, an object will begin to slip if it is in contact with a surface. And this is gonna obviously directly have, uh, have a relationship with the coefficient of static friction. Now, starting with a free body diagram, derive an expression that relates the angle of repose to the coefficient of static friction between the block and the plane. So let's start with a free body diagram. We've got mg, right? we have gravity. Now we have normal force and that is perpendicular to the, uh, to the surface that we were on. And then friction, that is going to oppose our direction of motion. Now you'd think, well, if we have normal up, friction right, and mg down, what is our actual driving force? So what we're going to do is we're going to change our coordinate system. Our coordinate system is going to match it's going to match our um, surface. It's going to match the surface that we are on. Now, that means that we have this angle right here. That is going to be our angle theta, right? Same angle theta as we have over here. 
but that's where it's going to lie on this axis here. So the angle between MG and that vertical axis is the same theta as our adjustable plane. So let's look at this. Um, we will do the Y direction first. It's gonna be much more simple because uh, there's no acceleration in that direction, right? It's not hopping on the, on the plane. So we have summation of forces. Let's put that down some more. Summation of forces in the Y. Okay, we have positive N. Okay, that is up. And then our down, right? Down along this length here, that looks to be mg cosine theta, right? Because it is adjacent to that triangle there. So that would be minus mg cosine theta, and that equals zero. So then we can see that normal force equals mg cosine theta equals the y component of mg because it's got to match perfectly, right? Like we talked about before, it has a very similar relationship uh, like friction does, right? Just like this, normal force only, it doesn't have a breaking point unless that you're gonna break the object you're on. Um, whatever uh, mg, whatever weight you're putting on it, normal force is just gonna match it unless you break the object. So let's go back down. So some of, the, some of forces in the y, we've got normal force equals mg cosine theta. Now let's look in the x, summation of forces in the x. Okay, our driving force, and remember acceleration should probably match your direction of motion, right? Positive acceleration should match where it's actually going. So instead of up the slope being positive, down the slope is gonna be positive this time because that's where we're going. So we have mg, this will be our sine theta, right? Because it is opposite to that angle there, so mg, sine theta minus our static friction. And that will also equal zero because we are just about to slip, right? Now, that means that we have, and oh wait, before we do that, um, let's break down uh, that force of friction using the fun equation. So we have mg sine theta minus mu s times n equals zero. And what we're trying to find is an expression relating theta to the coefficient of static friction. So that's why we need that mu there, is because we need to actually get an expression for that, that mu. We also know what normal force is. Very common in, in physics, like we talked about with tension, you can solve for what tension is in a pulley problem and then just plug it in elsewhere so that you don't have another force clogging up your math. Same here with normal force. You can usually find out what is normal force and then substitute that in to simplify your math. So we'll do the same thing here. Okay, so we have mg sine theta minus mu sub s times mg cosine theta, like we found before, equals zero. Now that means that mg sine theta equals mu s times mg cosine theta. And to solve for mu s, divide over your mg cosine theta. So that would give you mg sine theta divided by mg cosine theta equals mu s. You can see that those masses and the gravity will cancel and sine divided by cosine uh, simplifies to tangent theta equals mu sub s. And if you wanna solve this in terms of the angle instead of mu, you could say that theta equals the tangent inverse of mu s. Okay, so this is really important because that is a very simple way 
to relate the angle of repose to the static friction in a scenario. Okay, and we're going to do that in the next slide. Now, whoops, that's zoomed in, mountain climbing. A climber stands on the rock face of a mountain and her boots have a static coefficient, uh, static friction coefficient equal to 1.0. That's a, an amazing static coefficient of friction. Um, what is the steepest angle she could stand on without slipping? So let's use our equation that we just found. Let's see, we have, oops. tangent theta equals mu sub s. So we know for mu sub s, right? Mu sub s equals 1.0. We want to know the angle at which um, she would start slipping, which is the angle of repose. So if the theta equals tangent inverse of mu sub s, that means that the tangent inverse of 1.0 would be our, uh, our angle of repose, which happens to be 45 degrees, which is a very steep angle. Those are probably the best climbing shoes ever. 45 degrees being the angle of repose. So now she sits down on the slope. Okay, part two, she sits down on the slope and suddenly starts sliding when she wasn't before. What can we infer about her ski pants? So let's uh, zoom in and I'll use this little pocket over here. So we have the force of the shoes, right? Force of the shoes must equal mg sine theta. Okay, let's say we have, right, we have this here. Um, hmm. girl, mg, and we've got that theta right there. You can see that the x pulling her down, pulling her down the incline would need to be measured with sine, okay? just like we did before. So the force on her shoes, uh, I guess the friction, I'm gonna change that right there. The friction of her shoes equals mg sine theta, right? Balanced. However, friction in her pants, right, is obviously less than mg sine theta, which means that the friction of her shoes has to be greater than the friction in her pants, which makes sense. That's not groundbreaking, right? Shoes are obviously made to prevent slipping on a surface for injury. Pants, not really made to keep you from sliding. That's not the point of pants. But if uh, friction equals mu sub n, we assume the girl's normal force isn't changing. So we could also say that the mu of the shoes must be greater than the mu of the pants. All right, uh, th this is the first uh, video that we're doing on friction. There will be four in this series uh, to finish out chapter two, but this is, was a really good uh, introduction to static and kinetic friction. Uh, and next time we will continue on doing a couple more examples.